Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for being here. It's a cozy group. Just know where to run if uh, if anyone starts sneezing, as we say in America. Thanks for all uh, for all of you coming here. This is the music money flow of music publishing specifically for creators. So just a show of hands, who knows what publishing is? Awesome. Okay, that's better than we accepted. It's amazing. So I want to start out with some introductions. Uh, we're going to start off first with the man, A. Bashan, CEO and founder of BeatStars. What's up, everybody? Thank you for coming out. We have Kyle Brown, general counsel at BeatStars. What's up, everybody? Won't you take time? Please hold to all. And the wonderful and talented Tantu Beats. I am Bonnie from BeatStars, and I'll be your moderator for today. So we're going to jump right in. So I think this is a, a good moment to jump in for Kyle and Tantu, specifically for Tantu as a creator and Kyle as legal counsel uh, in the music industry. What is music publishing and why is it so critical? Well, um, so the way I see it, uh, it's, a, a it's, it's a revenue stream that was created by the music industry a long time ago for various reasons to protect the, the copyright owners of, of, of our like music. Um, and it's, it's, it's a revenue stream that's inherently important for every musician, I would say, whether you're a producer, a singer, if you just do ghostwriting, if you, if you sell beats online, it's, it's something that's, uh, you gotta understand how it works because if you make a living through music, there will be a moment where it will become very important to you. So the earlier you know about it, the better. Absolutely. And Kyle? I would always say, um, a lot of people always focus on the master recording, but the composition and the publishing is more important because the composition, if you think about science, composition is the DNA of music, mm -hmm. right? So every piece of DNA of composition has basically a child. The recording is a child, right? Mm -hmm. But you need that DNA first. Mm -hmm. So it's always important in my opinion to learn about the composition first, the DNA, because it controls all the recordings, it controls the samples, it controls all of these things. And then once you understand that DNA, right? Every place where you see a recording, you know that the DNA is there. And that's where music publisher comes in, right? Like a doctor or a surgeon to find that DNA, identify that DNA to help you collect that music publisher. That's right. That's right. And how many songwriters do we have in the house today? Okay. So this is really important for songwriters as well. I'm also a singer songwriter. And so understanding publishing from every aspect of music creation is super, super critical. So we're hopeful that after today that everybody gets a little bit more education on publishing. Um, this is for you, Abe. Why, why do you think publishing is so forgotten in our industry? Um, I think it's forgotten, especially like for, you know, music producers, session musicians, even engineers. It's, it's, it's a pretty complicated path to register your works, uh, have it represented by a publisher and then have it be collected, you know, globally by, um, with, you know, in collaboration with all the PROs that are out there. It's, it's a complicated process. Cause I think a lot of people forget that a song that gets distributed to like a Spotify, you know, and I think a lot of music producers, they're been brainwashed their whole life to feel like they're just the person behind the scenes creating the work and that they're not eligible for any ownership of, you know, the song. And so they just, you know, I think they've been taught probably purposely by a lot of the music industry to kind of just like, ah, don't worry about, don't worry about your publishing. Just, just sign this work for hire agreement or just do this. And, you know, we'll figure out, we'll figure that out later. And I just, I don't think there's ever really been a front door to walk in. You know, there's, there's, it's been predominantly controlled by the major music companies. And there really just hasn't been a front door for the everyday musician that's writing music, that's 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 adding, you know, uh, you know, guitar or piano or anything to attract. There hasn't been a front door, and I think that's what's 
in our mission is to open that front door for for the everyday musician to just register their works and, and start collecting on that on that revenue. So awesome. Um, so this is also a good pivot moment to ask you then why Beat Stars Publishing? Like, what was your thought behind? Hey, I need to start Beat Stars Publishing. Well, I guess it started with just like talking to talking to producers over the years and a lot of them will you know have produced some some major songs like massive songs that have billions of streams and i would ask them i'm like yo are you are you collecting the publishing on that song and a lot of the, the a lot of the time producers would be like well what's that i don't even know what that is i don't even know how to do that where do i go where where's where's the destination and so we stars was born to kind of like liberate producers in a way to kind of build leverage for themselves in the music industry and to not just like conform to whatever the music industry told them. So um, B-Stars being the leaders in the online music producer community, I felt like it was our duty to, to get in this space. Now, this is a space that I've been thinking about for since the inception of the company, 15 years, but I, I, I couldn't really nail down um, the proper partner to help administer all of our producers' works worldwide for a long time. People thought Beatstars was a joke, you know, not just Beats, the, the producers, right? And they thought that, oh, these guys are just kids uploading beats to get to the internet, and they're just selling their beats with all their... Everyone assumed that we were just... Producers were selling their rights away on Beatstars for $30, and that was like the assumption in the music industry. And that's never been the case. You know, Beatstars licenses allows for creators to maintain and own all of their publishing rights, control it. And we've never been a, a what do they call those, those kind of fucking companies that, uh, um, Cakey. No, no, no. The, uh, the, uh, um, you know, when you go buy a sample on Splice, what do they call that? That's like, uh, royalty free, royalty free bullshit, right? Like this is, this is not a, we don't, I'm sorry. Like we don't, we don't operate in the royalty free world. You know what I mean? We, respect creators and we um, respect the ownership of their works. So it's just always been a mission of the company. And finally, you know, with the success of Old Town Road, really, right? Like prior to that, I was having meetings after meetings after meetings with all the major companies, door closed, door closed, door closed, door closed. And they didn't see the value in, you know, the online music creator. That song kind of just woke everybody up. Right. It woke everybody up and it, and it allowed us to not just reopen those doors, but it allowed us to dictate the deals that we wanted to create with, with the major publishers. And um, and thankfully, you know, Sony has been a, a great partner and they believed in the mission and, and restructured their whole admin um, part of the business just for our creators. And so it's been it's been a blessing to see our producers get paid over. $15 million in the last three years. So it's pretty cool. And I think for me, um, before I started working at BeatStars, watching the video of you and John Platt was also for, further educated me as a songwriter on publishing and, and didn't, I had seen messages about BeatStars being backyard producers and then seeing Old Town Road. And then when you step into the world of BeatStars and seeing how massive the community is and how talented everybody is it was life-changing for my brain as well not just as an employee but uh you really become involved by it so so then for you also when what was the moment when you realized like oh publishing is critical for my career too as a producer so, yeah so i think the first time for me was quite a while back was like in 2012 I had my first placement uh, in the Netherlands, and it was with a rapper called F, uh, the best sheep we would know. Um, and uh, it was released under like a sub uh, sub label of Universal, it was called Noah's Art. And um, I just got sent a, a contract, right? Like, yo, this you you got the placement, sign this, and it will be on the album. And they didn't pay me. Uh, there was no master royalty in there, like, and I thought that was normal, right? Uh, but the only thing that I did have was my publishing. So I ended up making a couple hundred bucks from like the Buma Sema, which is the PRO in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So that was when I was like, okay, apparently this is, and I thought actually that was my start. I thought, oh, that's how producer, that's the only way that producers get paid for placements, just 
they don't get paid up front, they don't get master splits, whatever, they just have their publishing. So I think my start was a bit different, but uh, it wasn't until 2018, 2019, where I was having like bigger songs that were like played on the radio. Um, and that, that it became apparent to me like, okay, there's actual money in this. And then around the same time, I had like a, a couple of huge songs in Argentina and in Italy, like a couple of kind of random placements, but like super big, 60 million views, whatever. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, I think I got to make sure that there's a company that's collecting those revenues because I feel like I'm missing out on a lot. And that's luckily almost, that was almost when you guys were ready to to make a deal with Sony. So that was for me, that was like a, a bit of the moment where I was like, okay, now I can finally collect those bigger placements because the PRO in the Netherlands, like it does their job, but it's miss. I think every PRO is kind of missing pieces in there, especially internationally. Like they don't have their, they don't have enough tentacles to, to really grab the money from where it really should come from. Right. And there's an important question that I want to circle back on, but I have to ask Kyle, what do you think are, for you as an attorney, what are some of the biggest misconceptions in publishing? I think the biggest misconception is if it's not in the contract that someone sends you, it doesn't exist. Right. And um, it's very important, like you said, to have someone that's, you know, able to understand a contract, but to be able to explain to you what you need. So he just told you everything you need in the contract, right? There's four things that's important. You need an advance or fee. You need points, master points. You need publishing. You need to figure out who owns what. Is it a work for hire like A mentioned? Is it a sample? Um, who owns the master, who owns the publisher, right? And I think a lot of times there's a huge misconception of how important it is. But I, I understood the value and learned about um, how important it is when I first started at BeatStars. A lot of my a lot of my day to day role was really the more the commercial side of business what we do, right? But 30 percent of my time now has been more so on the publisher because all of the major labels are saying, "Hey, can we clear this record? Hey, can we clear this record? Hey, can can, can we clear this record?" And one of the things we pioneered for our producers, BeatStars Publisher, and a lot of them are here, um, Tattoo, Seco. Um, we started doing a non-exclusive uh, non sample for songs, right? So the value, the, the biggest misconception is there has to be a work for hire. You have to transfer over your rights. But we've been advocating as a publisher, we're not trans, our, our, our guys and gals are not transferring their rights. They're going to license their, their rights. They're going to own their rights, masters and publishing. And you're going to pay them a fee and they're going to get advanced uh, points and all these different things, right? So I think the biggest one of the biggest misconceptions about publishing and the advance, the, the master points is that if it's not in the contract, it doesn't exist and you can't think about that, right? You have to say, hey, there's a contract here. Who do I know that may know something about it? Ask them and they'll tell you, attorneys will tell you, good ones will tell you, like, this is what you deserve and you will get that, right? And if you, you link up with a publisher, like he said, they'll help you collect that, all of those different royalties and their revenue streams. Amazing. So, um, you know, I want to jump into a little bit about why we're here, right? The money flow of music. So how many points are you entitled to? Like a little bit of the educational part of it. Okay. Uh, this is a great question. So first explain what are points. I think. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, okay. Let's, and I'm not going to try to like take too much time, but like when you think about a record, there's two sides of it, right? How many people know how, uh, what are those two sides in here? Raise your hand if you know what are the two sides to a track that comes out. Okay, so you have the recording side, which is the sound recording copyright, and you have the compositional side, which is what's the, what we call publishing, right? So when a song comes out, typically what happens is a label reaches out and say, hey, we want this song. And typically I get that, hey, we want to use this song, right? Say Ride Wave, come see me, right? Uh, so the label reaches out and I basically ask, what's the advance? Meaning how much money can an artist get up front for their work being used, right? And this could be, sometimes if it's an indie label, it might be 200. I've negotiated deals where it's 50,000 for a non-exclusive on the, on the advanced side, right? And then you have on the sound recording side what's called master points. That means every time that song gets streamed on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, Pandora, 
there's a, a royalty stream that the producer is owed. And the average right now is two to five percent. We're getting around three for producers, but it's two to five percent, right? Um, and then what A texted me about the other night, which is very important, is connected to that master points in the US, what we call sound exchange, right? And a lot of producers don't understand sound exchange, but that's just like Pandora, right? When Pandora plays internet radio, you get sound exchange or what they call neighboring rights, right? I don't know if you all heard that term. Yeah, for the for the Dutch people here, that's Satan. Yeah, yeah. And then and then the other royalty stream is the publishing. And it's very key you all understand this. So all four of us are producers, right? And we make a track together. Does anyone know what's, what we should all get? Does anyone know what we should get? Right, right. We would decide, but like, what, what would we typically get, you know? Uh, like from the whole thing? Yeah. Or like half this, so like the recording, like, so probably like, or the like eight? Well, yeah, you, you're almost there, right? So he said half. So we would get 50. So 50 is reserved for the artists. 50 is reserved for the producers. So each one of us, if we were like fair, we would all get 12 and a half percent. Now that fair is somebody may do some killer drums or uh, the melody that's better. And it's like they get all of it sometimes. But majority of the time we're splitting this in fours. Right. So Tantu has this publisher. Say, for example, we're all signed to B-Stars Publishing. B-Stars Publishing would collect the publishing and then everybody would get their split. Right. The master points will come from the label. The label will pay out. And then the label would also pay out the advance. So that's kind of that's kind of how the publishing side works. And that's also kind of how the sound recording side works as well. And also just to like compare, because there's a lot of independent artists. It's not, you know, a lot of producers are also licensing to independent artists right. as well. So when you guys, for example, like DistroKid, right? When you, you guys are getting splits on DistroKid sometimes, producers with the artists that they're collaborating with, those are master those are master points. Those are master splits. Um, for yeah, the, and, and, and I so. think also important to know, like if you work together with an independent artist, or maybe even if it's an artist that's signed and you really work together like a duo in a way, here's of course exceptions when it's also master points. I have one artist I work with that we just split everything through half. Like I'm basically also the artist, you know? So it happens, it's rare, but especially like if you look into the music industry with the labels and the, and the majors, they will hardly ever allow that, yeah. but it, it happens. I think it also depends on the uh, relationship, like how Tattoo is and his contributions as as like the featuring artist or... Yeah, yeah, so that's for songs that I make as well. I master them as well. You know, I make like cut downs for, for TikTok. I do like, I, I even upload it to this you know, like... And can I add to that too? Uh, it's very important to like, as an attorney, I love when producers tell me what they've done. Because if you've done all that, it's like, well, this song may need to be, like they said, the tattoo says, slick it for me. Right. right? It may not just be two to five percent. It may be half and half. It may be 15 percent. It may be, you know, something different. So a lot of times your contribution and how you carry yourself and just having a knowledge of what you're like, what you're worth, it dictates the, the percentages as well. Awesome. Just to add on that too, yeah. like I know a lot of producers that will discover an artist and, you know, that artist doesn't have a lot of money to kind of spend on beats, to spend on mixing, mastering, marketing, all these things. And the producer kind of acts like a pseudo kind of like manager in a way or label and they'll partner with them on a song 50-50 just because they're, they're contributing so much in the initial stages of those artists' careers. And that's okay sometimes, like giving away a beat for free because you really believe in this artist and you want to see them propel and be successful. So right. that stuff happens. But also there's also, you know, there's also a point where sometimes producers are too aggressive and too kind of like, you know, they're asking for too much from an artist when they should not be because the, the artist is way more popular and the artist has way more resources and the artist has got a lot of, you know, backing behind them. So it's like, you gotta like pick your, pick your poison in a way, I guess. Awesome. Uh, I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah, no, go. And I think to A's point, we just kind of have this free flow of conversation. That's why it's good to have a good publisher and also like just get people around you because they know what the other side would accept. Right. So when I meet, when I start working with producers, nine times out of 10, I'll probably work with the attorney on the other side, the label on the other side. If, if it's the, you know, um, UK, for example, the manager and the publisher. So I can kind of gauge what they are willing to accept. And to A's point, I've seen some, some great songs go unreleased because someone was like, 
they just didn't know. And it was like, I want 70% of the publishing. It's like, you're really only entitled to 12 and a half percent. And they're just adamant about that. So it's just very important to just educate yourself on your value, your internal value, what you're contributing, but also just know that in order for a deal to be done, both parties have to have something coming out of it. All right, so that's important. Right. This is for Abe. Um, how is Beat Stars Publishing? How have you and, and the Beat Stars Publishing team, how have you guys been helping creators collect on their publishing? Yeah, I think so many different ways. There's some people in this room, I'm not gonna name names. <laughs> I love these guys. Um, They've given away sometimes their publishing to certain artists because they believe in them. It happens, right? And not having a publisher help look at your license agreements, look at your your deals, look at kind of how you're arranging your relationships with your placements and artists, and not over committing. There was another producer, you know, in um, in in South Korea that signed away all his rights to a major label artist that found them on B Stars and. He didn't speak English and he didn't understand the contracts and just signed it all the way. And he begged me, hey, can you can you help us? Can you figure out something? Can you do something for us? And I don't think we were able to because it, it was a solid agreement that was that was signed. So I think producers navigating through this online world where things are just moving so fucking fast, artists are reaching out, send people are sending agreements. Every, we're getting too excited and we're just like, you know, we're we're not thinking about our business, our intellectual property, and, and just taking, just having a team to kind of look over things for you, um, give you the, that kind of advice. And that was also one of the reasons, you know, why we started B Stars Publishing, because we kept seeing this over and over, producers being taken advantage, taken advantage of, and um, and it needed to stop. And having guys like Kyle and Irfan and our, our legal team, who are, are like, Kyle just dropped the gem, you know, he, they're pioneering a whole new way of licensing music to the major labels that was never acceptable. And um, it's, you know, and that's kind of like part of our suite of services, I guess, in a sense, where you have access to these guys. These, you know, lawyers are $400, $500 an hour. And these guys are doing crazy work for just our admin clients where we're not really generating a lot of revenue from, but we're just, it's part of our mission. Like if a producer is going through something or a producer's having any kind of challenge, B Stars is always there for them, no matter what. So that's why we started B Stars Publishing. Amazing. Yeah. Love it. And do you want to add to that, Tantu, for for you as a creator? How has it been game changing for your for your career? Um, of course, um, collecting the money is <laughs> important. <laughs> game changing to my bank accounts. <laughs> um, you know, what but is also, But also having the resource there, right? Like to Abe's yeah, point, yeah. you have somebody like Kyle in your corner. Yeah, oh no, of course not. So what is very important the moment you, you sign a publishing deal, whether it is with a BeatStars uh, or, or another company, um, it's important to know what resources you're signing into. You know, um, I know that like, I don't need Matt a and R's connecting me with that and that artist because I have my own network. I know what artists I can link up with. Uh, I can do it myself. You know, I don't. I don't need help with that currently. But I will. I, I know I will need legal help. So I know, like, okay. I know that being signed to you guys and Sony, I'm able to get free legal help, which is crazy. Like you mentioned, like you, you probably that's like 300 euros an hour or whatever. And now I can send over a contract, and within a couple of weeks, like that shit is sorted. And I think that's a massive help because usually, you know, like even sometimes you have a placement and you're talking about like, let's say a seven euro, a 700 euro advance or, or dollars or whatever. And it's like, you're even making that calculation. Like, okay, is it worth getting a lawyer or an attorney for this? Because the costs are going to be higher than the fee I'm getting. I might as well just sign it and get it over with. You know, I think that's what happens a lot to producers. So I think having this included in the service like this is amazing. For me personally, I'm in Amsterdam often uh, because I'm signed with Sony. I can use their studio whenever I want. I don't have a studio in Amsterdam, but because I live in Berlin, uh, that's also a huge perk for me. Like whenever I have artists over in Amsterdam, I can just work in the Sony studio whenever I want, just because of that administration deal. Like, bro, I'm, I feel blessed for that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, you know, I was reading on the plane ride over here. It was a long, very long. 
<laughs> it took like five naps and I was still on the plane. Um, that hub rev is eight to 10 times less than master royalties. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I found that super interesting and just want to, I'll speak to, I'll turn this over to you, Kyle. Like, how are we addressing that problem? I think when we're, we're, t we're showing the labels that compositions are important. And I know I piss a lot of them off, but I'm like, <laughs> if our if our team's compositions are involved, so are we, right? And I think there's a huge push, right? So for example, publishing is, as you said, the master side is the what everyone's worried about. Um, but we're we're making that push. A lot of people are making the push that the composition side should be equal, right? If not equal, less, uh, but co closer to it. So making that push there. And then also just, just having these type of conversations, right? Because if people don't know the importance of publishing, if they don't understand why it's important, they won't advocate for it. And a lot of times because of the rep, the revenue difference is there's not going to be, there's not a lot of conversations. People just focus on the master. They just focus on Spotify and, and YouTube. But what a lot of people don't realize is again, like I said earlier, the, pu the publishing and the composition is that DNA. And every label knows that. Um, so there's just got to be this, this mindset of shift that starts with all of us here to just realize that, yeah, the, the sound recording, it, it generates the most money right now. But without the composition, without the publishing, there wouldn't be a sound recording. And I, just to add to that, I think like what Tantu is doing is addressing that part by being more involved as an artist. So I think a lot of producers, you know, need to be in the label business. You know, I think they need to be in the like discovery and and working directly with these artists because, you know, without producers, these songs are not going to get done. You know, these songs are not going to get pushed out and your roles are really, really important. And you guys could be, you know, providing a lot more value. So if this, uh, if you want to partake on the master side, like get more involved, learn about what a label, uh, how a label operates, learn about what what is it you can do as a music producer that could help this artist's career trajectory and um work out deals where you're you're more involved and not just the background person in the studio just making beats and another i think another reason bonnie you, you say well, why did we start Beastars stars publishing i mean look look every every week every week billboard hits are made on the on the platform right. every single week and it's like gotten to a point where number one songs and billboard hits and it's like okay shit this is the game is changing so artists who younger artists in today's world they're, they're very introverted they don't wait for a and r's to send them beats and shit like no one does that anymore like nobody does that anymore artists if you're smart they're going straight to the internet they're discovering their beats they're they're finding it at, at that moment. They're putting it out that night. They're not waiting around for a whole cycle of people and dependency on other people to get their work done. So when I started seeing that start to happen 10 years ago, and I said, okay, hit after hit after hit, I'm like, yo, the, the community needs like representation. And it started to make me think that Beatstars as a marketplace is actually just a funnel right. for the publishing world. Now, when you look at the total addressable market of publishing, I think it's like 50, 60 billion dollars. It's way bigger than licensing music online. So if Beatstars can be that funnel into song creation where millions of songs are being created every year on the platform and you guys are starting to build that catalog and you're able to you know, value that catalog, you're seeing investors right now going around spending 10 times the value of catalog to acquire it for producers. So I started to think, okay, producers can create a catalog of a thousand songs, 200 songs, a hundred songs, and they can change their whole life with maybe having the option to sell it if they wanted to, or just continue to collect it year over year for the, you know, we don't see Spotify and YouTube and all these pl platforms leading anytime soon. I think there's actually more and more new media platforms onboarding like TikTok that are doing deals with the publishers, doing deal with, you know, the, the platform. So that I feel like there's going to be even more revenue streams coming out for, for online beats. And so I think producers need to start shifting their focus from just not focusing on building their own online beat business, which is the core of what we do. It's important, but I think they need to learn how to unlock their online beat business 
in order to build a massive publishing catalog that could be life changing for them. So that's really where this thing is going. Right. Um, I want to shift just a little bit. So, and we've all been to many panels. So one of the juiciest topics here at ADE is AI, AI and music, right? So how many people have gone to any AI and music panels since you've been here? So we also had one yesterday. It was really well attended. Did anyone come to the Beat Stars, Splice, and uh, Lemonade.ai panel? Awesome. Thanks for coming. We love you. <laughs> um, so, and I'm our friends from Lemonade.ai are here. Shout out to Lemonade. Hey, so, jumping into that juicy topic, I have to ask, and I'll maybe Abe, Kyle can can lend to this answer is, how do you think that AI is gonna play a major role in music publishing? We don't know yet. Um, hopefully at some point as this new way of making music and the creative process gets sorted out and where we're able to attribute people's works to the output of AI and it's accurate and we know what percentage and we know how it was created and, and all that good stuff. And when we can prove that to, you know, the legal systems and governments and um, copyright folks around the world to recognize AI works as copy copyrightable material, and we can prove it with a trail of how, how the music is created, um, then it's going to be great for music producers that are, you know, um, scaling their businesses and creating music with AI. But as of right now, it's not defined. And so as long as it, maybe Kyle has some more insight on it, but as long as it's not defined right now, it's really gray area where you can utilize it to, to be extra creative, um, output more music, get to where you need to get to, get these placements. And then hopefully when it's all sorted out, you already would, would have a lot of music out in the world, even produced in partially by AI, um, that you can, you know, claim and have and have ownership on. But I don't know if Kyle has any thoughts on that. I think it goes back to and you make great points. I think it goes back to that DNA that we talked about. Um if you own that DNA, you can do whatever you want with it. But when you sign it away and you don't own it, whoever owns that DNA, like Abe said, once it gets sourced out, uh, the majors are doing deals with AI companies. And the people that's going to have all the leverage and value are all the people that own the DNA. So I think it's super important to own your DNA because if you own your DNA um, and you work with ethical AI companies like Lemonade, right, there's going to be some great things that you're going to be able to do. I think also to A's point, one of the hardest things that, again, this part of the 30% of our week is just sort of splits. Like, I love doing it, but that is a very difficult process. People not stop being friends sometimes over splits. So if AI, my, my thing would be some type of AI that would allow us to scan everything that's been done in the past. I, I probably shouldn't say this because someone's going to steal this idea. Scan everything, that's been, <laughs> scan everything that's been done in the past. I guess what's being created in the future um, so that we can basically apportion a percentage to who owns what. Because a lot of times when I hear stuff, I'm like, I, there's one producer that may have got reached out to first that may have created the melody. And I love the melody, right? But there is this other producer that we may have read or we know, and they've done the drums. And the drums is the whole song, right? The drums is what's like taking this over the top or sometimes it's vice versa. And, you know, sometimes you can be biased on your side and the other side can be biased. And I think AI will... Uh, you know, it goes back to that DNA, right? Helping you be able to reproduce your DNA uh, and control of that, but also help us to be more, from a legal standpoint, that arbitrator, right, in the middle that helps us sort out who owns what, why they own what, and kind of like what the blockchain was supposed to do, give us a record, and just make the registration process a lot easier before they, you know, everything gets to the Right. And, you know, pivoting, you said, uh, we use the word DNA a lot, right? Uh -huh. um, I would say for this man here, he I call him a serial entrepreneur, and I've watched him educate producers on not just throwing their careers away and be careful with what you sign. I made those mistakes as a songwriter previously in my career where they're like, you're not a known writer, so we're going to take 25%. I'm like, oh, okay. 
foolishly, right? Because I wasn't educated. Um, so there's, I'm sure they talk about it all over the world, but heavily in America right now, there's a lot of talk about Katy Perry, John Legend, all these musicians, artists, producers that are selling their entire catalogs, right? And so I think that being, a, being an entrepreneur, my question for Abe is how do you think that that's going to impact investing long term, right? Instead of the traditional, I'm just a producer, now people are looking at their careers as like, oh, I can take this catalog and invest it into a home or a apartment complex or whatever it is. I think every everybody's situation is different you know um you know there's a reason why investors are paying 10 times multiples on your catalog they know what it's going to be worth in the future right they know that this digital world of music and consumption is going to get even crazier as we you know as these devices continue to evolve and even more devices start being incorporated into our lives like vr and other things right so they know they're betting they have the data they know if someone's willing to pay you 10 times more for your piece of work, then you, you might be thinking you're getting a good deal. But trust me, these guys are, you know, putting, putting, putting the, uh, uh, you know, forecasts into work and they're building models around what your music is worth. So, but I will, I won't say that it's not a bad idea sometimes. Like it depends. Like if, if someone's willing to pay me $10 million for my catalog of work and I don't have shit and I can take, you know what I mean? And I can take that 10 mil to create a whole new catalog of work, right? And bet on myself, reinvest in myself, then it might be a good it might be a good idea, right? It's you know, it's kind of like a 10-year advance, right? So um it just depends on where you're at. If you're loaded and you're chilling and you you, you know you don't really need the 10 million dollars, maybe you know you can hold out, you know, maybe you can hold out. It just really depends on everyone's situation. All right, right, right. Tanta, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I agree with the fact that it's it's just different for every situation. And it's also, it, it very much so depends on your patients, I guess, as well. You know, like because these people investing in those catalogs, they know, okay, I will make a return on this investment 15 or 20 years from now. Even not within that time, we'll make it only my kids can see a return of that investment. And usually things like that uh, are about patients. But, you know, sometimes, let's say you quit music. And you don't want to have to like handle your publishing situation and everything. You're like, you know what? I'm gonna start a hotel in Turkey and I'm gonna just sell my catalog. You know that you don't want to deal with that anywhere. It's a great option then. Amazing. Can I, can I add to that really quick? Just to be clear on what we're saying, if your catalog is making a billion, let's say your catalog is making three million dollars a year, right? Someone will approach you and say, hey, I'll give you thirty million dollars for it, right? So. To both of their point, it's just something that like to always think about. You don't have to do, or you could. It, it makes sense to you. But the worst thing to happen, again, this goes back to DNA and the ownership. The worst thing to happen if you have that opportunity, it's something you want to pursue, is they're gonna want to see the agreements. Mm -hmm. They're gonna want to see who owns what, how much of it do you own. And one of the biggest things that I put in the agreements for our producers that a lot of people think they just give it to me, they don't even care about it. Most agreements now say you don't have the right, you only have a one-time right to assign your rights, right? So that's important in the agreements. You want to make sure that you even have the right to assign anything, right? Because if you don't even have the right to assign anything, you can't even, you can't even assign it to someone. But if you have that right in there to assign it, and that opportunity comes where you say, look, I want to uh, buy a hotel in the French Riviera, all right? Uh, that's what I want to do one day. Buy a hotel in the French Riviera. And I don't know, we've been making $5 million a year. Someone comes and they says, hey, I'll give you $50 million. And the hotel is $30 million. And you have the right to assign. You have that option. You know, and also I think a lot of it has to do with, like, so, say you are making that much money every year from your catalog, but you, you're, you're weak on the synchronization licensing side. You're, you, you don't have the right avenues to get sync licensing and really like um, maximize all the revenue streams from, from that, that work. And you're like, I don't have the relationships. My publisher is not really supporting me. Um, um, my music is you know decreasing 20% in streams per year. It might be a good time to let go of it, right? So it just, it just depends on 
the situation. If you're you know strong with the publisher and you got a strong sync team and you're like on Netflix every week and your music's on this every week and you're just like, man, I'm just building more value, more value, more value for this music. Um, then it's more, yeah, it's I think it's more of an active business, I guess. It depends on how active you want to be with your catalog, right? That's that's really where it's at. So amazing. So I know we're getting a little short on time, and I definitely want to leave room for Q and A. Uh, by a show of hands again, who here is a music creator not in a pub deal? All of you are signed to publishing. <laughs> I was like, so, I so like L, L, L B size, no, so no, 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 <laughs> okay awesome so i am going to leave it to the guys to kind of chime in and then we're going to jump into some q a but if you're a music creator how do you get started on publishing Sorry. <laughs> i think one very important thing that we did cover and that's just important for people that are not in the publishing in the situation yeah it is you have time, right? You have a time window. You have to come up. Also, there is a limited amount of time. Like uh, PROs will will keep your money for like let's say a year or three, two to three years, and then it will just disappear. They will use it for their company event or whatever. Plus, uh, if you're not signed to a publishing deal, every song that's being generated is generating publishing revenue is also being split in half. That's something we didn't cover, but. Uh, half of the so let's say your your song is being played on the radio, you get ten bucks. Five bucks goes to the uh, to the composers and the the writers. So if you're registered with a PRO, you will get that money probably. But then five five euros of that ten euros will go to the publishing owner. If you are not a pub, if you don't have a publishing deal, that five euros will not be collected. It will just go to the black box. It will just go into the pockets of other people straight up. Yeah, and that's a whole other topic that we didn't have time to cover today, which is black box. But we do have a QR code that if you guys scan it, uh, we will send you some education on the black box. Uh, so let's I just want to some Q&A. Huh? Let's go into Q&A. Yeah, let's yeah. jump into some Q&A. It, uh, is there a microphone, Alex, my girl? It's not a, a microphone. If the room is so small, we'll be able to hear you. John. Um, yeah, to make it simple, because it's a little bit confusing to me, if I'm an artist and I produce music, uh, who collects the publishing royalties, whether it's uh, a set release or a release on the label? Do you want to answer that, Kyle? So it depends, right? We have this thing in America where we call it 360, mm -hmm. right? And if it's really bad, we call it a set of 20. That means yeah. they mean they got you wrapped up. But typically, the label... <laughs> the, label the label collects on the master side, and then, like Tantu was saying, your, your PRO collects, you know, your writer side. And then your publisher, they collect your, your publishing royalties for that specific song. So that's different entities? Yeah. Different entities. Yeah. Yes. Not, does that come from... But your publisher can do it all, actually. Your yeah. publisher can, if you sign with a publisher, they'll work with all the PROs and do that part for you. Right. Yeah. Next question, any more? Yeah. Uh... Yeah. We'll take you first. Uh, yeah. So uh, I've been I've been using an American platform, United Masters, to sell my beats and collect royalties for a year now, and it's been working out good. But I'm, I'm curious, just in general, like, is there, is there more that I could do in terms of, like, what's what's the steps to find the right publishing deal or like, uh, like what kind of royalties are they collecting for you? Uh, yeah. like streaming, streaming, master royalties. Yeah, master royalties. yeah, yeah, yeah. master royalties. Yeah. First of all, you need to take the beats off that shit. Because <laughs> you ain't selling nothing compared to what Beatstars is, is going to do for you. <laughs> first, first of all, you don't need a series. You probably switch it. You know, you know, we don't think so much of video. That's good. So, uh, yeah, come on, come on, Beatstars, man. Sell your beats there and then lock in with us on the publishing side and we'll get all the, all the publishing side. You can let them keep doing the master side. That's cool. You can still... Let them do that that sure. shit, but um, <laughs> we're we're here for you, bro. And I think on your question too, uh, and I think Tantu is getting to this. There's typically two types of publishing deals. I think we need to cover this super quick. A pub admin deal that means hey, we collect the percentage or fee. You own everything, and then you have what's called a co-pub deal, right? They collect probably half of. They collect half, right? And they own half, right? A company will own half. We start we do admin deals typically. So that's that's the main thing to look out for. A lot of times as a creator getting started, right? You want to try to get yourself into an admin deal where 
have somebody a fee to collect for you globally, but you still own and maintain that DNA. I know a lot of producers, probably like you, you're releasing sometimes instrumentals to streaming services like Spotify and stuff like that, uh, right? So, or, yeah, some, not, not all of them, but yeah. Yeah, but a lot of producers do. They'll put like chill beats, lo-fi beats. They'll, they'll put just instrumentals on there. And a lot of producers don't understand that you get it. You can also collect 100% of the publishing on that too. So yeah, you're getting your Spotify royalties from like DistroKid for your instrumentals that are on there, but you're missing out on a, a whole, the whole other part as well. Uh, gentleman in the jacket. Uh, yeah, you asked us earlier who in the room has a publishing deal. Yes. I, I'm in the U.S. I'm registered with ASCAP. Um, I have my publishing with ASCAP. It, is that what you were asking, or am I missing something? Well, they're only collecting a part of. Yeah, that. yeah. So one thing about ASCAP, um, in the, I think it was 1948, the U.S. deal was called consent decrees. So the PROs cannot collect mechanicals, right? So that's the difference between having just a PRO where they act, they act on the writer and composer side. They're banned in the United States from collecting mechanicals. So you're missing out on a lot of these different streams because you would need a publisher to help you collect those mechanical royalties, which a lot of times are, are a bulk of the revenue that you get when your compositions are used. The sometimes, sometimes it's the majority of the revenue you could be missing out on. Right. Where do we get that QR code? Uh, I'll see, I'll see this we'll take care. Now, and just anybody else? Because I, I do want to mention before everybody bounces from here, uh, there is the breakthrough with BeatStars demo listening session and judging panel. And uh, anyone that signs up for the QR code, I'm happy to give you a BeatStars t-shirt. They're super dope and super cozy. Yeah, you got a lot of merch. Some other merch. Uh, any more questions? Yes. So um, whenever you start producing, you most of the time don't have a lot of money uh, uploading some experience. So you just start making beats uh, with a concurration or can you say confidence <laughs> competition <laughs> on these stars or used for any platform is immense. How will you make your beats stand out and make sure that you get discovered? Because even we were talking about people trying to take advantage of big uh, royalty bills and stuff. Brilliant. Even to get discovered by someone like them is very, very hard. So how do we get it? I think I'm gonna have ten to an eight. I, I, I think actually like the the so the next the demo uh, drop section. I don't know if you have time to stick around, uh, but I think we will be covering that a lot actually. Yeah. Because we're gonna listen to beats and gonna critique them like, okay, what could be better in this? How could this stand out more? So if you have time to stick around. But I think also, um, Ava, I'd like you to answer about this. Something you're super passionate about is is how did how does this beat stand out amongst the millions of beats on Beat Stars? Well, the thing is, I'm not a producer, right? I'm a songwriter, so I think Tantu's more has a better insight on how you should approach making beats, probably. But in terms of marketing them and you know finding an audience for them, um, you know, it's just like every other business in the world. You gotta, you gotta create that menu, that, and that menu's gotta have a, 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 a whole large consumer base that's wanting that kind of music. So, you know, on Beatstars, like, some of the top keywords, for example, are, you know, Drake type beat, or sad beat, or, or you know, uh, drill, or trap, right? So, you know, it's understanding what the demand is first, you know, but also making music that's true to you though, yeah. you know, because I mean, there's so, so many, so many genres are doing so well on BeatStars. It's not just those tags, there's thousands of them, you know, generating $60 million a year. So the, to answer from a creative standpoint, I mean, I mean, how do you approach like when to make it, you know, for the, for the market, you know? I think uh, for, I think it's personal for everyone. Um, for me, a very important moment uh, where I was like, okay, I think I finally discovered what type of music fits me as a brand. And that was kind of me going back to the moment that I started listening to music and what was I listening to? What, what kind of music do I enjoy without, without the knowledge of how to make music? Like, you know, before you start making music, you're a fan of music. After that, you're also a fan of music, but differently. The period before you start making music, what really kept you listening to the music? What kind of music was it? And what in the music was it that attracted you so much? Now try to create that music for your younger self, you know? Try to excite your 14 year old self. And I think that's usually where someone's signature sound is. And that's also going to be the identity, the DNA of your business. 
And I would encourage you to also stick around for our meetup and talk to some of our BeatStars producers and maybe they'll yeah. mm-hmm. they'll connect with you out there. So I'm just right after this or right it's, now? It's going to be... we got uh, Accent, Seco, Freck in the building. Uh, we got Levi Beats in the building. We got so many dope yeah. producers here. Amazing. Is there any more questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> this is not about the publishing. Um, this is more about the... Uh, seasoned artists building their profile. Um, I'm quite, I'm into Vistars now for three years. Uh, I really like all the stuff, but I also am missing a few things that I think with all the success and uh, could easily be realized. And that is the way uh, your profiling details, like that, like there is a very clear example I did. Right now, you cannot uh, specify which instruments right. you have used in your uh, composition and arrangements. Uh, only very old fashioned uh, uh, orchestral wow. instrument categories. But I, for instance, would like to specify I've used this synthesizer. If you download my old pack, you can even have the patches with it. I have uh, used this gear, um, so that would be an, one example. And also uh, the way you're building your cat, cat, in my case, there's many categories. And uh, for me, it's still a bit unclear, like, okay, I have these playlists, but I cannot publish them. Do I have to make it into an album? Uh, but then it's not a playlist, like I want it to be organic, so I want it to grow all the time. So these are things for me like, um, I would easily pay a hundred dollars a month if these things would be better. Like for me, it's not only a platform, it's also a backup system. It's a legal system. It's even might be a system that uh, will take care of my heritage when I'm gone. Right. Think about these things. I'll, I'll show you how to have instruments to your tracks, even custom ones, you know, that I think to be uh, important. Um, yeah. But I do agree, like having more... I'm, I'm just... Yeah. I, like, I'm a and I'll show you guy, I'm in this, this, this shit for yeah. 30 years, yeah. and I really like what you guys are doing. Yeah. But, um, I think there's a lot more... Oh, so sure, for sure. You can also ask that. more money for that. So it's not like I'm asking things. Are right, you got a hundred dollars right now? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'll take down all your feedback and make sure yeah. we bring it back to the team and uh, yeah. we explore it all. I appreciate it though. Okay. We have time for one more. Any more questions? Any more questions? Oh, I know. I have a shameless plug. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay, so I'll have my call back. All right. Roger, what's up, everybody? My name is MJ, CEO of Lemonade Music. Uh, Lemonade Music is an AI generation company to try to help music producers. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm an artist myself, so I love music, love musicians, and that's why we partner with BeatStars. So I want you all to pay attention to AI companies in the near future because it's a brand new thing that's happening, and it's a brand new way for y'all to get paid, right? So we are creating a new future right now, but we're paying artists on a monthly basis for that DNA. Um, so if you have MIDI melodies and things of that nature, reach out to me. Uh, the Instagram account is Lemonade Music, or you can just find me during the meetup. Uh, but we're also going to be figuring out the future of attributions, royalties, to continue to get paid and all that good stuff. So, so AI is scary, I know, but there are companies that are looking out for y'all. I just want to let y'all know. So come find me afterwards if you want to chat. Thanks, guys, so much for coming. You're really being here. It's going to be rich and job. Pinch that one. Pull, pull, pull. So, Splints. <laughs>